make this an especially meaningful conversation for you today? Um, I don't, so I think that, so the first time I took the LSAT, I did a um, self-study and then, but I was also like in undergrad. And then the second time I took the LSAT, I did a class. And so this time I'm self-studying again, but um, without being an undergrad. So more time and more like, I think better, but I'm not sure if I'm going about it like the best way. Cause I'm kind of just taking like everything I've learned from like the first time I tried to self-study and then the second time when I did the class. So I think it'd be helpful to know if I'm going about it the best way, if there's anything I should be doing or anything I should not be doing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So what are some things that you're questioning about whether it's the right approach or not? Um, so I know they say that you're supposed to do it under, um, like take practice tests under the same conditions and everything. And so I'm doing really good. And so my practice test that I use is um, the book one. Um, I kind of have it here, actually. I'm using, it's like a paper book of like just 10 practice tests, whatever. But I'm not doing them online, so I'm not sure if it'll translate. Because I'm doing, if I'm getting results from this, like, will I get the same results? Because you know how now with digital LSAT, so I'm not sure if that makes sense, the question. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. I, th I think it is important to do at least a few exams in the digital format, but unfortunately, most exams are only available in paper, not digital. There are currently three exams in the digital LSAT format on LSAC's site at familiar.lsac.org. You can do exams. Yes, so check it out, familiar.lsac.org. There are exams 71, 73, and 74 in the digital format there, so you can play around with them and see what it's actually like. And ideally, I would even suggest using a tablet so you can really replicate exactly what the testing experience will be like. As for the others, you could do them on paper and then do all your work on scratch paper to the side. Or if you have the PDFs, you could pull up the PDFs on your computer screen or your tablet. And then once again, do your work on scratch paper to the side. Okay. And then what do you think will probably be like the biggest difference with it being digital versus being paper? Because I feel like is pretty much you can't change the topics it's just logic reason logic games reading comp so but I, do you think there will actually be like anything of significance to really look out for yeah there are a couple of things and, and you're right that the content of the exam has not changed at all but the way in which it's delivered is a little bit different two big differences are first off on digital you can only see one question at a time okay so That's you can't think though right uh, yes and no. I mean, I think that for logical reasoning, it could be useful to help you focus. But on games and reading comp, you can't have those groupings of associated questions available to you at a glance. Like you don't have a bird's eye view of all the questions in a game or a passage. You can okay. only see one at a time. Okay. Okay. So that's okay. That's something to get used to. Yeah, because it is different. Like with here, with the practice things, you get like all of them at one time. So I guess that is something to look out for. Yeah. And then um, the other big thing I would say is that also on digital, you cannot draw on or notate on the questions themselves. Okay. You can only do work on the scratch paper, to, scratch paper to the side. There are some tools like highlighting and underlining, but they don't work that well. And they're not actually letting you write on the stimulus, for example, or write, write on the passage. Okay. And then also, um, would it being close? I'm taking the November LSAT, so would it being closer? How do you go about uh, preventing being burnt out from studying? Because like if you see the same material all the time every day, you kind of just get annoyed with it. Sure, sure. <laughs> so two big things. One is don't take full-length exams on consecutive days because okay. that does lead to burnout. It's a lot of work to do a full-length exam and to review it as well. So space them out. Mo for most people, two a week is probably the most you want to do. Okay. Then the other thing I would suggest regarding burnout is take plenty of breaks when you're not doing full-length exams. And even consider taking a day off here and there. It won't kill you. Yeah, what I was doing, I guess, is not the best thing. I was just taking, like, one a day, um, like, because we only have, like, six weeks. So I figure six weeks, six, like, seven days, I don't know, like, 35, and it will get me there. But I can see, like, how that's not the best approach. So. <laughs> it's a common mistake. But the real value in doing these exams is not just to do more. It's really to get questions wrong so that you can learn from your mistakes, to so figure mm -hmm. out what exactly you're likely to get wrong. Okay. And then um, what do you think about, as far as like um, applying and stuff, what do you think would be the, like if you don't get the LSAT score that you're going for, how do you go about putting that on applications and still trying to 
is the fact that it wasn't the best that you were hoping for? That's a great question. And there, there are two answers to that. One of them is that if you can show that, let's say, for going applying to undergrad, if your SAT or ACT score did not reflect your true potential, but your GPA does, then you could reference that as at least some evidence for making your case. Otherwise, there's not too much you can say. You can, yeah, sure, you could say you had a bad day or the digital LSAT didn't work properly or something, but the numbers are the numbers and the, really, the real answer would just be retake. Okay. And then do you think there's like a max you should of like amount, because this will be my third time taking it. Um, and kind of like at this point, probably be my last time. Or do you think it's worth continuing on with taking the test over and over? There is, there is a limit. As, there is some reasonable limit at some point. I think that obviously seven or eight times starts to become a little much. And there mm -hmm. actually are new retake limits that are going into effect this year. But I'd say for you, if, if this is your third time, that's totally fine. One more could be a fourth time could be okay. But beyond that, it starts to look like you're a little bit flaky or not really knowing when to take it when you're fully ready. Okay. That just starts right. to become a concern for them. So I would say if you get close to November and you're not scoring where you want to be, consider withdrawing and delaying to a later test date when you'll have more time. Okay. And then how do you go about um, making your personality stand out more in your applications? Well, the personal statement and any essays you have are the biggest places to do that. Admissions is not my focus, although I have worked with a lot of admission officers, both current and former. And it's really about telling a story in your personal statement and making them like you. And so okay. we can get into the details a little bit if you want, but those are just the, the broad recommendations. Well, more so, because I'm thinking like, there's only so many ways, because they always ask you like, why do you want to be a lawyer? And it's like, there's only so many ways you can say like, why do you want to be a lawyer? So I'm just like running out of ideas, like how to go about saying it, but I want to say it like in an original way. Sure. And I mean, if you, if you show your personality that will be original, I would okay. often recommend tying it back to some personal experience you've had, whether in work or at school or in your personal life. And then obviously in some part of your application, it should come across why you want to go to law school. And ideally, okay. if you have any real world exposure to the practice of law to show that it, your understanding of it is not limited to what you see in the media, that's useful too. Okay. And then um, as far as the tests go, something I'm having a lot of difficulty with when it comes to the practice test is or our questions that deal with the, or the sufficient versus necessary. Um, keep, I keep confusing the two. Like, not necessarily, like when I, I know that when I'm like studying it, I can separate them easily. But on the test, when it's like a lot of time is running, it's just, it's really easy to get confused. But so how would you go about, or what would be a good strategy to go about not confusing the two of them? So you're referring to sufficient <laughs> necessary condition indicator words? Yes. So well, there, there are lists of them. There, I mean, I have lists of them on my site and I can send them to you. Okay. And it's just really just becoming, recognizing those words when they come up. So like okay. when and whenever would be sufficient and. Well, my issue, yeah. I keep confusing the, or I keep confusing the necessary for the sufficient or like how you don't always need the sufficient for the necessary, you know, or I don't know, I guess it is more like, cause I'm doing good with everything else except for like those two. Cause I'm always like, I don't know what's going on with those. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I, I'd refer you to my articles and videos where, where I cover this. It's more than we can get into right now, but okay. it is worth slowing down and taking the time to learn this because this comes up on all sections of the exam, in particular logical reasoning, but also on games as well. Okay. And then um, what about separating the conclusion from the sub conclusion from the main conclusion? Any tips for that? That's a great question. That's, that's a more nuanced, difficult thing. And we'd have to look at examples to really get into it. But uh -huh. the subconclusion serves as evidence for the main conclusion. So it's about understanding how the different parts of the argument relate to each other. And if you, you could even remove the initial evidence and the subconclusion would still serve as evidence for the main conclusion. So you could try crossing off different parts of the stimulus and seeing how they logically relate to each other. Okay. Um, and then going to the test day, what are some things you think would be good to put, like on the day of the test, like some things to do? Like, is there like any color to wear or um, like any food to eat or anything like that? Well, food to eat, definitely. I can cover that one for you. So like snacks, like granola bars, um, water, coffee, banana, um, eat something light before you walk in. Nothing, nothing too much, but something to give you a little sugar boost and so that you're not so hungry because test day can drag on, especially if the proctors make a mistake of some kind or take a long time to get ready, then you, while you should be there for only about three hours, 
in some cases, it does become more like four to six hours if there is some sort of error on their part. And we don't want there to be an error, and there most likely won't be, but you also want to go in with the expectation that there could be. And so okay. having snacks and being well-armed is a, is a good way to handle that. As for things like what color to wear, it's really about what's, what's personally meaningful to you. And so if you have certain associations or like a, a, a lucky charm or something on like your, your key chain, you, yeah, you want to bring, that's fine. The key is that, of course, it, they want it all to fit inside that gallon-sized Ziploc bag. Yeah. Um, and then what do you think would be a good way to go about making sure that you are, like, for the timing, they say if you're running out of time for a reading comp to um, just skip one of the passages, which, and then I know you're supposed to go with the passage that has the most questions, like, always do that one, but is there another way to go about picking which passage not to do if you're running out of time? Yeah, sure. So it would be based on the topic. So if you don't like certain topics or you read a passage and you have no clue what they're talking about, that's obviously a good candidate to skip. There also is a rough order of difficulty on reading comp. So passages three and four might be a little tougher than the ones that came earlier. Also, if you dislike comparative reading, the, the dual passages, that would also be one to consider. Okay. Um, and then as far as like logic games, um, I haven't seen like a lot of circular questions with that. So is it really worth studying? Like, I know you're supposed to study everything, but like, are, I feel like there are certain things that are more, like grouping games, you have to know that like off top. But I think, so I think, it's, is it a good idea to put more emphasis on studying like grouping games versus studying circular games? I don't think circular games come up that often. Absolutely. Circle <laughs> games are one of those more rare game types. So I would focus on the more common ones first and master those. And those are ordering, grouping, and combinations of both ordering and grouping. But then rare game types would include things like pattern and mapping and circular games, as you said. And so it's worth having some familiarity with them and doing it maybe at least one of each type so that you're not totally thrown for a loop if they come up. But it is worth focusing your time on the more common game types. Okay. And then what do you think is something that a lot of people overlook when studying for the LSAT? That's a great question. Wow. So not devoting enough time to studying overall. That sounds like that's not your problem, though, if you were looking to do an exam every day. I'd say the, the other common mistake I would see is not spending enough time engaging in detailed review of everything you got wrong and also everything you had difficulty with. And this takes a long time. This could take at least three hours for reviewing a single exam that you did because there's the questions you got wrong and there's also all the ones you had difficulty with. So even if you got a 170 on a practice test, that would be about 10 questions wrong, but there would also be another 10 to 15 where you were down to two and you guessed and got lucky and it could have just as easily gone the other way. So it's already 20, 20, 20 to 25 questions, assuming you got a 170. And if you got lower than that, there's even more to review. And so spending five, 10 minutes a question quickly becomes over three hours. So it's yeah. a lot of work, but it's worth it. Okay. So you would say it's not good to just study the ones you got wrong, but study the ones that you also sometimes got right. Well, the ones you got wrong, of course you should review those. But then in so many cases, students will be, will be down to two choices and guess, and sometimes they get lucky. Okay. But because it, because it could have just as easily gone the other way, that it could have been wrong next time. So it's okay. equally important to review that as well because it was just chance that made it a correct answer for you that time. Then also, if you're choosing something but you're not totally confident in it, maybe you would have picked something else the next time around as well. And so that's also worth reviewing. Okay. Um, and then, let me see. Also, um, one thing is like, is it a good, so one thing I've been doing, studying the older ones and then studying the newer ones, just like going back and forth, but for, or I'm talking about the practice test, but should I study only the old ones leading up to the new ones, or is it good to just go back and forth between older and new ones? So we're currently at exam number 88, which was the September LSAT. <laughs> and with only about a month remaining, you don't want to do older exams at the expense of newer ones. Okay. And so I would look at the, the exams you have remaining, look at your schedule and see, will you be able to cover everything from the 70s and 80s before test day? Okay. If not, then you definitely don't want to do the older stuff from, let's say, the 50s or 40s or prior, because then you wouldn't be getting to the new ones. At the same time, though, you might want to reserve some of the new ones to save them for a future potential retake. So one thing I often suggest is maybe do the even-numbered ones now and save the odd-numbered ones for next time if there is a next time. I didn't think that is a good idea. Huh. 
Uh, and then, yeah, I think that kind of answers all of it. Um, oh, so if I already did a writing sample, then I'm good on that, or should I consider redoing the writing sample? You don't need to do one again, but you can if you like. So if you feel like you, that you could do a much better job next time than you did previously, then that's something to consider. I wouldn't place too much importance or, or thinking about it too much, though, because it is unscored. But it is unscored, but do they, the law schools consider it when they're looking at your overall um, tests and everything? They will look at it often in cases where they have a concern about someone's English proficiency if they're a non-native speaker or okay. if their English grades in college were really low. They want to make sure that you actually are good at writing, and they also want to know that, you know, un unlike your personal statement, which could have been edited and reviewed by others, this is the only unfiltered writing they have to look at. Also, if you, like handwritten writing samples aren't as likely to be looked at because they're hard to read, but now that the new LSAT writing is digital, they're more likely to look at it. So if you feel like you want to redo it and have a second shot at it, you, you can. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, that pretty much answers like everything and like beyond. So that was Fantastic, awesome. Angie. I'm really glad I was able to help. What would yeah. you say is the biggest insight you got from our call today? Um, the not doing them every day and kind of do them and then review them and then not just review the ones you got wrong, but review the ones where you guessed. Because I thought that if you're getting down to two answers and then they both could have been good, but then you went with one that was better and you also really got it right, that's not really worth reviewing. But I can see like why that's not the best thing. So I would definitely be reviewing the one where I kind of got down to two and got lucky. Um, but then also I'll put more emphasis on reviewing the test more so than doing the test because you're right, it is kind of like a lot to do one a day and then still have to review. So I think that's what I got the most out of this. Fantastic. I'm really glad to hear it. Well, please keep in touch as you move forward. I'm happy to help however I can. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.